fortress.
a sadder Good morning. Welcome to Desert Chapel this morning. We have a whole bunch of people back for the winter. Raise your hand if you're back here from your long summer. Raise your hand. Yay, yay. So it's good to see everybody here this morning. And thank you to those that are watching us online. We're always glad to see you here too. So our missions for the month of October and November. Next week, we'll hear from uh, Marianne Gray regarding the shoebox ministry. But the shoebox ministry is going on along with the turkey boxes for the families over at Avalon. Now, just as a quick note, if you go out into the lobby, you'll see the signs on the tables. And when you bring the things in, put the things by the signs. If you, if you would like to donate a turkey, there is a sign-up sheet for the turkeys, and it says to let Rick Kyer know, or Keith Hale know, or myself know when you would like to bring those turkeys in so that we can make sure that we're here and get them in the freezer. So that's our other ministry that's going on. So we have the shoebox ministry and the turkey boxes. So thank you for your support for both of these missions. Uh, let's see, clothing closet. I understand that we are looking for at least one, maybe two people on Saturdays to come in and oversee uh, the clothing closet workers, uh, just to make sure that the shoppers are, are getting handled, taken care of, and just making, just overseeing uh, the 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 clothing closets on Saturdays. So, if you're interested in that, please see Bev Wren. She can help you with that. Uh, let's see, quilters. Quilters start up on Tuesday at 9 o'clock. Carmen, raise your hand. Car see Carmen come in. She'll be here, and, and she's looking forward to a winter of quilting. So with that, Pastor, you had some things to say. Don't I always? <laughs> uh, we started our Bible study class last week on Monday. We had quite good attendance. And if anyone would like to join us, it's not one of those things where you have to be there every week or you miss, miss out on something. But if you would like to join us, we meet in the, in the lobby there at 1 o'clock on Mondays. And this week we're going to be looking at all the different kinds of books in the Old Testament. Uh, there are at least five. If somebody finds more, let me know. But, you know, this is, should be a good learning experience for me as well. I always learn from you because, you know, some of you have, know more about these things than I do. And it's fun to kind of exchange information and to learn from each other. And I try and keep it as light as possible. Uh, we, last week we looked at the book of Genesis alone and are a fairy tale and when he said that it was during a lecture series and the air kind of left the room <laughs> it was really a uh, an aha moment but you know things like that we'll pick up on and uh, explain okay so i invite any, as many of you um or several copies who was it? Somebody showed up with about six copies on last week. <laughs> and fortunately, one of them was the one I, I couldn't find my copy of it. So thank you. <laughs> OK, let us continue in worship.
Thank you, Michael, gorgeous as ever. If you can comfortably do so, please stand and join in the call to worship responsibly. Oh, that we knew where we could find the Lord. That we might learn how the Lord would answer us. Will the Lord contend with us in the greatness of divine power? No, our God will give heed to our cry. Let us join together in our hymn of worship number 354, I Surrender All. Verses 1 through 3. a time of prayer we have many things to be thankful for but there are many less fortunate than us let's remember that there are still to this day American citizens stranded in Afghanistan and also many collaborators who helped us out during the conflict there. I, uh, <clears throat> my heart goes out to all of them. I know I hope yours does too. I'm thankful too for all those returning winter visitors. It's great to have you back. The only problem now is a whole bunch of new names to remember. <laughs> So please, if you have a name tag, wear it. <laughs> if not, please put your name on the list at the back. Um, I, when I first started in ministry, one of the questions I was asked, what it will be your greatest challenge? And I said, remembering people's names. And it has proved to be correct. I am hopeless at remembering names. Um, people I work with every day and meet every day, that's fine, but after that, I'm I struggle, so please forgive me and help me if you can. Um, I think we should continue to keep in prayer Liz, who has uh, got some serious health problems. I call her little Liz. 
He always sits over there on the third row back and seeing that space vacant really bothers me. So keep those in your prayers, please. And we are entering what I call the beginning of preparation for Advent. You know, Advent's coming, folks, and so is Christmas. Um, so this is the time when we prepare ourselves spiritually for the beginning of Advent, the time of preparation to receive our Lord again. Let's spend some time in silent prayer, praying to God about the things that are on your heart and your mind. Thank you, Lord, for all your gifts. Amen. Will you join me in the prayer for the people? <coughs> Excuse me. Prayer for the people. O oh God, our guide and guardian, you have led us apart from the busy world into the quiet of your house. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth, and in the comfort of our souls and the upbuilding for every good purpose and holy desire. Enable us to do more perfectly the work to which you have called us, that we may not fear the coming of night when we shall resign into your hands the task which you have committed to us. Now will you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us away from temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? 
Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Please stand as you are able and let us join together in our hymn, O oh, Jesus I Have Promised, number 396. message doesn't scare you too much. Am I too rich? Wasn't intended to, but I, you know, I, I come up with these titles sometimes and I think about it later, but it's already in print, so it's too late to change it. So, um, When we read this piece of scripture, it's interesting to note that this is in all, all of the Gospels. The story is repeated. So obviously it was considered to be very important. And it, it really begs the question, can rich people be Christian? But then we have to say, well, what's rich? If you were to go transplant yourself to Cuba, for instance, you would all be rich very rich. On the other hand, if you were trans to transplant yourself to Hong Kong, you'd be poor. You know, we're looking at different societies. The Cubans are, you know, some of them bar barely surviving. Where in Hong Kong, if you don't have at least one Rolls Royce and a Bentley, you know, you, you don't have anything. 
You know, not that there's anywhere to drive it, because the island's not that big, but <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's all about possessions, status. It comes down to comparisons and where you are compared to those around you, if you will. Someone once calculated that, I know I'm going to kick that over soon, <laughs> if all the money in the world was divided equally amongst everyone in the world, everybody would be poor. Because some countries, you know, people don't have anything. This country, which is, I forget what the percentage is, it's like less than one-fifth of the world's population, has something like 60% of the world, world's wealth. But if you were to spread all that wealth out over all the countries in the world, everybody would be poor. So where would the philanthropists be? <coughs> the outcome of that kind of thinking is socialism, communism. Um, in those countries, it's been tried. You know, distribute the wealth. But you notice there are always some rich people in these societies who live off the work of the poor people. It's, almost, it's impossible to actually spread the wealth equally. Um, I don't know if you did, but many years ago, um, school children were told to read 1984. Um, the book about the utopia, so-called utopia, um, where everybody was equal, except some were more equal than others. <laughs> and that's unfortunately the situation. There will always be certain people that will want to be superior to the others. And we'll get there one way or another. There are countries where it's been tried to make an equal society. It doesn't work. If it did, there'd be people standing at the borders of those countries waiting to get in. But you don't see that. People are swimming away from Cuba, not towards it. In our situation in the world right now, if we consider ourselves comfortable to the, most to the greatest extent. So how, should, how much should we be prepared to give away? Now this is not the Sermon on the Amount. <laughs> <laughs> that comes later in the year. <laughs> but rather a look at what Jesus was trying to tell the people after Jesus questions the young man about his attention to the law, the Ten Commandments is what he's talking about. And the young man replies, yes, I, I kept all of the Ten Commandments, just like I was told, and I obeyed the law. Probably considered himself a pretty righteous individual. If the young man had stopped right there, at the end of verse 20, as it turns out, in Mark's Gospel and walked away, for one reason, we wouldn't have a lesson. But no, the young man, instead of walking away, say, says to Jesus, what more can I do? And that's when he gets hit with the big statement. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Now, as I've said, that sounds like a great idea. But then consider, if you've got some money which you have invested, like most of us have, as we go through life, we realize that young people at the back pay attention to this. You realize you need to invest some money for when you get older. Now, as a young person, if you were to give all that away, then what? You would become dependent on someone else later in life. Now, the question is, is that a good thing? To be solely dependent on someone else 
may be solely dependent on God who will take care of you. Remember the lilies of the field, they reap not, neither do they spin, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not adorned like one of these. So we are, God will take care of us. But you know, it's, it's not a good feeling to be dependent. We want to be independent, don't we? That's what we're taught from, from being, you know, in grade school. You've got to learn to be independent. So the way that this challenge is met by Jesus, say, okay, here's what you need to do. It must go right against the grain for this young man. Give up your wealth and follow me. If the young man had been of modest means, perhaps the response from Jesus would have been less dramatic. The sign of a greedy person who has a lot is that it's almost impossible for them to be generous. I didn't say impossible, I said almost impossible. Fortunately, that's not always the case. Most of you have no doubt become aware of Bill and Melinda, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They give away a lot of money to various charities throughout the world. Bill Gates has to be one of the wealthiest men in this country. But he gives money away regularly. He lives pretty well, too, on his own island. But he is generous. Sometimes rich people can be very generous. I want to tell you a story which has some, I have some contact with. But there was a man who fought during World War II, was severely injured. When he came home to the country after the war, he took some time to recover because of his injuries, but he had to find something that he could do with a small amount of money that the military had given him to make sure that he could live. So he started investing in a very small way in real estate. And over the years, he built up a big real estate portfolio. I mean big. He was worth millions. It took him, see, about 30 years to do it. But he made a lot of wise investments and made a lot of money. Now, he was a member of a Methodist church and he took part in the church life by, he taught Sunday school classes, adult Sunday school classes, and was involved in other events. But he found out that the church needed a new piano. The one they had was uh, <coughs> not a good one, <laughs> not like this. <laughs> and he found out they needed a new piano, so he talked to the music director and said, if you could have any piano what would it be? And the music director thought for a while and said, I forget what it, I think it may have been, um, it begins with a P, can't think of it now. Anyway, Petrov, and that was it. It was a Petrov. That's a, that's a good brand, right? It's, it's almost like the Rolls Royce of <laughs> grand pianos. <laughs> and so he went out and he bought one. A concert grand. I mean, this thing was, fortunately the church was large enough to accommodate it, but it was huge. But it had such a beautiful sound. It was installed in the church and they had a concert to celebrate this beautiful piano. And he was asked by the board of trustees, well, where would you like us to put the plaque? The dedication plaque. And he said, I don't want one. Nobody needs to know where it came from. Now this was, you know, we're not talking $5,000, $6,000, more like thirty. <laughs> even in those days. It was a very expensive piano. But he said, I don't want anything on it. The only person that needs to know I paid for it is God. God knows I bought it. 
There was one person on the board of trustees, the pastor and the music director. They were the only people in the whole church who knew where this new piano came from. And that wasn't all. The church Bibles were getting a little bit tatty. And instead of having one in every pew, you know, you had to search for them. So he buys a whole lot of Bibles, about 300, and has them put in the pews. Again, no dedication, no plaque, nothing in the Bible to say who, who paid for it. But he said, no, I'm doing this for God's glory, not mine. He lived in a nice house, I must admit. Actually, he lived in a penthouse suite on the beach in Singer Island in Florida. I mean, that penthouse was worth a lot of money. But he didn't think only of himself. He thought first of the church. What does the church need? What can I do? And I think, I know this man supported missions and other charities, even outside the church. But he was using his wealth for the glory of God. What do we learn from this interchange between Jesus and the young ruler? In, in one book, he's called the rich young ruler. Early Bible compilers must have considered this is an important story. As I said, it's in all three of the major bo- of the synoptic gospels. When we look at this story, we need to ask ourselves, what can I do that advances the kingdom of God? Is it a monetary thing? Is it a case of physical work that needs to be done? Is it something that you have a unique skill to give that benefits the church? God does not necessarily want um, all our money. In fact, God doesn't need any money because there's no use for money in heaven. But there is down here, most certainly. You may have heard it said that God has no hands and feet but yours. When it comes to doing things in God's kingdom, he needs you. You are the way in which God not only helps the less fortunate, but the way we serve others as a witness to the power and might of our God. Maybe sometimes someone will say to you, why did you do that? Why did you help me then? What was your purpose? And the answer has to be, because I am God's child, and God expects me to. And I'm not going to disappoint God if I can help it. You are God's hands and feet. You are the way in which God not only helps the less fortunate, but also the way we serve others as witness to the power and might of God. Remember, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. What better way to preach the gospel than by doing? We are required by God to witness to our faith not only by our speech, but by our actions. God is not a God of benevolent listening, but a God of action, and you are the action. So what can you do for the kingdom? I would suggest that every one of us has a skill that we can use for God's glory. Every one of us. God made us in his own image. If in doubt, check Genesis chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. God needs those he has created to do the work for him on earth. Don't say, I can't do that. Remember, God made you, and God made all things possible. 
Here's something to think about. There was a church in a retirement community, not unlike this church, except the average age of its congregation was in the low to mid 80s, average age. There was some in their 90s and some even in their hundreds. <coughs> Excuse me. They wanted to do a mission project but, you know, how can a bunch of old folks do a mission project? You know, you can't go out and, and you know, sleep on cots. You know, you know those cots, and the problem with them is, you know, they're hard to get into and they're even harder to get out of. You don't want to do that. <laughs> even I don't like to do that. <clears throat> they wanted somehow to do a mission project that would make a difference in the community, or in a community even. <clears throat> The dilemma was, how do we do that? Nearby was a, a depressed community. It had older houses, many of, most of which needed some repairs. So the pastor made inquiries to the local um, social services to find a family that really needed help. After the own, own homeowner had been contacted, the social with by social services, they agreed to meet with some church members. So the pastor and another person went over to the house and asked if the church could help by doing some work around the house for them. And they, they were not cautious at first, but they willingly agreed in the end. They said, okay, a date was set. And on the Monday morning, a group of about 12 people from the church showed up. They realized it was quite a daunting task. The place was very run down, things were falling off apart, uh, floors were, had been attacked by um, termites, uh, windows were broken, the paint was peeling off, it needed work. But the group, before they left church, had prayed that God would give them what they needed to do the job. Now there were some retired craftsmen, there was <coughs> some uh, experienced do-it-yourselfers, if you will, and there were a few that were, <laughs> wasn't sure which end of a hammer to hold. But nevertheless, they said, you know, we can do it. With God's help, we can do it. Some of the physically Less able people provided meals. Some said they would drive to the Home Depot store about five miles away and fetch anything that was needed that, we, that had been forgotten. <coughs> so work started. Tools appeared from nowhere almost, it seemed. People brought tools in their cars. They the truck, pickup truck arrived with a circular saw on the, on the back, um, ready to saw anything that needed to be sawn. What tools they, people didn't have, they went to their neighbors and explained that they needed to borrow these for a week. The whole crew with the feeding team, the runners, the prayer team was probably about 25% of the church in all. When all was finished, in a week, it's amazing what you do in a week if you set your mind to it. Floors had been replaced, carpet had been laid in the house, which had never had before. A swamp cooler was replaced with an air conditioner. The, house, the whole house had been painted on the outside. Broken windows had been replaced. The yard had been tidied. It's hard to re realize it was the same house and all this done in a week. <coughs> when all was finished, the lady of the house, whose late husband had built the house himself, literally, cried. She was so happy that the house was now much more livable. 
the other side of this story is that that lady was bringing up her grandchildren because her daughter had been killed in an automobile accident and she had only what the state provided she was an older lady plus what she could earn working at the local grocery store three half days a week that was the total income the oldest child was still a teenager in school who slept in a shed out the back because that was the only space but the gratefulness that she showed the next Sunday she came to church and brought the family although they were from quite a way away just she wanted to say thank you to the congregation that was really showing the hands and feet of God in action and we had people up to almost 90 years of age working on that project so don't tell me you're too old <laughs> This is the way that we can do God's will. And I, quite honestly, I was part of that crew. I was on staff at that church at the time. And what a feeling to have done something like that for a family like that. Talk about someone that needed help. So I'm sure there's a few around here that could use some help like that. So we think about a mission project you know that's uh, I'm sure we can find someone who needs some help speaking of help after we have taken the offering this morning you did bring some noisy change did you if not you better run out to your car and check the ashtrays and the cup holders okay so let's continue with um, some music from Michael. You can take the opportunity now, if you like, to go out. I'm sure Michael won't feel to end it. And then uh, we will, as we had started to do at the beginning of this month, when the offering is brought forward, we will sing the doxology. Thank you, Michael.
may be used for your service both here in this country and throughout the world that all may come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ bless the givers bless those unable to give Lord hear our prayer Amen now comes the fun bit Okay, don't, don't forget the preacher's got some as well. <laughs> this is going to make a lot of noise. It's also going to be heavy. <laughs> both hands, come on, both hands. <laughs> <laughs> when Janine first suggested noisy change day I thought what does that mean and she explained it I thought hey that's a good idea there goes another five dollars thank you <laughs> by the way the purpose of this if you haven't read it anywhere yet, is to go towards our apportionments. We are behind, to say the least. So it's going to a good cause. And uh, hopefully we can get the, the bishop off our back. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any more loose change any time this week, just bring it in. <laughs> Oh yes, that's what we want to do next. If you would take your hymn book and turn to page 12. This is the Lord's table. It's not Desert Chapel's table, it's not a Methodist table, it is the Lord's table. All are welcome. All that is required is that you believe and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another, Merciful God, we have confessed that we have lo loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Fear us for joyful obedience through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. Why were we yet sinners? This proved God's, proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Moving to page 13 now. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you father almighty creator of heaven and earth and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn saying holy 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 lord god of power and might 
heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By his, the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivering us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus sat with his disciples, what was probably a Seder meal, and he was the host of the feast, and as was his right and duty, he, during the meal, took the bread from the table, blessed it before his father, saying, Almighty God, blessed are you who gives us grain that the earth might bring forth wheat, that we might have bread. And then he broke that bread. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take you all from this. Take and eat it. This is my body, broken for you. That must have shocked them. How can we eat Jesus' body? Then when the supper was over, there was one remaining cup on the table, Elijah's cup. And in Jewish tradition, it said that no one would drink from Elijah's cup until Jesus came or the Messiah came. And yet he picked up that cup and he said, Blessed are you, O God, who hath caused the earth to bring forth grapes that we might have wine. Then he gave it to the disciples and said, Take you all, drink from this. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many. That too was a shock for them to hear those words. Because in Jewish tradition, drinking blood was not allowed. So here they are with this meal laid before them. Jesus telling them this is what they must do in remembrance of him. And he mentioned in that speech, the many. You are part of the many. This feast is prepared for you. You are God's people. Will the ushers come forward, please? distribute the elements. If you are gluten-free, there is a little container in the white basket which is, has gluten-free bread in it. If you will take one of these, open it at the end and hold it until everyone has been served, then we will all receive together.
the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. blood of the Lamb poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink you all of this. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, you have blessed us with this holy meal, a foretaste of the banquet, banquet with which we will be included in heaven when we finally come face to face with you. Lord, bless, bless us this day. Keep us in your care until we meet again. Amen. And the closing hymn is number 405, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Will you stand as we sing together? <clears throat> Indeed, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Serve the kingdom of God in any way you can. You are his hands and his feet. Go in peace as the Lord goes with you. Amen. <clears throat>